Chiron Book 1, The Faded Land by Emergency Complaints. Chapter 61 I sat in a chair I'd made using stone shape on a big rock I'd relocated to my new home and watched my four apprentices play a game of catch. Instead of a ball, they were using an unrefined sphere of mana that held its shape only by the will of whoever was holding onto it. Every time one of them slipped, the sphere shrank a bit as streamers of mana escaped from it. It had only been ten minutes, and already the sphere was less than half the size it had been when they started. The game served two purposes. First, it was a way for them to practice both their ability to sense mana, necessary in order to even see the otherwise invisible ball, and their control of external mana to shift it back and forth. Second, it gave me a way to gauge their progress. Ayaka had taken the lead in the category of mana sensing, and I could see her track the sphere's progress as it moved back and forth, not just when it was near her. She also had the best ranged control, and the sphere lost the least amount of mana during her handoffs. All four of them were ready for the ignition ritual. In my estimation, Vihan's internal mana control would likely mean he had the best results, but all of them would pass well beyond the minimal threshold. Even if I held back from helping them, I suspected only Talik might have some problems keeping his mana in motion long enough to complete the ignition ritual. His early issues put him a week or so behind everyone else, a minuscule amount in the long term, but a significant disadvantage when they had less than a month's training. Things were going relatively well. I had all the mana I needed and was almost finished forming my lattice. Soon, the first generation of apprentice mages would be unleashed on the village, though I'd still be responsible for teaching them some specific spells. Depending on how things went, they'd all likely cap out at basic spells. That was fine for brute force magical solutions, which was honestly all the village needed to survive as long as their ward stone didn't break again. Though it wasn't like that had been all that useful any time in the recent past. I did have some concerns that an entire village of over a hundred mages might just generate enough magic to look appetizing to various monsters, but by the time they reached that point, twenty or so villagers would be able to keep their barrier running every second of every day without stressing themselves. The monosphere flashed into nothingness and the game ended. Without needing me to prompt them, they immediately started tallying up who'd lost the most mana and who'd lost the least. Getting an accurate summary of the results was also part of their training, with the idea being both to notice what everyone else was doing with their mana and to be able to multitask well enough to handle the sphere and keep four separate running totals in their heads. None of them got it exactly right, but between the four of them, they got the shape of things well enough to determine who had actually won. Once they were done arguing about it, they turned to me in unison to get my official ruling. Don't look at me, I said. You were supposed to be keeping track yourselves. Do you think you're right? Yes, Ayaka said. The others echoed their agreement, though with less confidence. Then I guess you're right, I told them. Have a little faith in yourselves. That must mean we're ready to receive our blessings, Shell said. Probably, yes, I agreed. Wait, really? Why haven't we done it yet? Vihan asked. Mostly because I have other demands on my time, I said. And because you don't get a second chance to do this. Yes, you could do well enough to ignite your core a week ago, but you'll do a better job of it today than you would have then, and next week, you'll do even better. Isn't it worth an extra week or two of practice to have a properly ignited core? How much of a difference would it make? Ayaka said. Always practical, that one. I was starting to think if there was anyone in the group I'd take on as a true apprentice beyond the ignition ritual and some instruction on novice spells, it was her. Last week, unaided, I would have said your ignition would increase your mana generation speed by sixfold. This week, I think you would have an eightfold increase instead. If you keep working this hard, in another month, that'll be elevenfold. At some point, it's got to stop being worth the diminishing returns, Vihan said. This is the foundation for the rest of your relationship with mana. The closer to perfect your ignition is, the more that power will multiply as you advance. That wasn't really true for this particular group. I had my doubts that more than a handful of people in the village would advance past a stage 1 core. Of those dozen or so that made it to stage 2, I doubted anyone would reach stage 3 without assistance. Even then, only 2 or 3 people at most would have the discipline and skill needed, assuming I provided the knowledge. If you find this story on Amazon, be aware that it has been stolen. Please report the infringement. What about your core? Shell asked. Hmm. A somewhat personal question, I said. 
only Shell knew my origins as I'd laid them out for the village council, but in societies where many people were mages and knowledge was much more readily available, giving away that kind of information could be dangerous. It allowed mages to more accurately gauge the strength of their enemies. Here, my only magic-wielding enemies were already dead, but there was always the possibility of a cabal member interrogating someone for information on me when they did finally arrive. Let's just say you'll need a lot more practice if you want to match me, I said. I didn't tell them that I'd be helping their ignition rituals along to smooth out any flaws in their techniques. There was no sense in letting them know that they could slack off and expect to receive similar results. Besides, I still needed another day or two to finish my lattice. The group started up another game while I continued my painstakingly slow work and enjoyed the view of the arbor. It was no night veil, but considering the village was located in a wasteland and none of the arborists had any real magical capabilities, they'd built something impressive. If the trees were a bit scraggly and the underbrush was thin enough to see the occasional wildlife scampering through, well, I imagined the place would look very different within a year. For now, the black barred hawk perched on one of the trees got to enjoy an easy view of its potential meals. I'd noticed that one particular raptor had claimed most of the arbor as its territory and I rarely saw any other birds. Admiring the hawk, my guard asked, nodding up towards where it was perched on the north side of the clearing where the arborists lived. Ha! Huh. Yes, I am. I should be watching my students though, I confessed. No harm in it, the guard said. Standing out here makes me think I went into the wrong line of work. Don't get me wrong, I don't have a problem being part of the garrison, but there's a lot of beauty in the arbor. If only he knew what he was missing. The arbor was something special, but only because the arborists tended to it and kept it thriving despite the harsh conditions here. There were some truly awe-inspiring views in this world that only a select few were lucky enough to behold. I doubted the arbor would ever be one of them, but I might help it along a bit once things settled down here. We're lucky to be here right now, too, the guard went on, oblivious to my inner musings. I was talking to Luthra, that's my cousin who works here in the arbor, and he told me that it just showed up a few days ago. He's been an arborist for nine years now and he's never seen that species of hawk before. I froze in place for a moment before turning my gaze from the hawk to the guard. Is that so? I asked, doing my best to sound casual. Has anyone else seen a hawk like that before this week? I wouldn't know. Why? Maybe it was just a coincidence. Animals did exist, after all, and not all of them were man-eaters. The arbor was the perfect place for regular, non-threatening species to make their homes, at least compared to the wasteland of rolling hills full of nothing but scrub grass and the occasional muddy stream winding its way down from the mountains. Then again, I had been waiting for Noctris Cabal to show up. An animal familiar spying on the village was a reasonable opening move. It was too bad there was no way for me to tell without capturing the hawk to inspect it, and if it was a familiar, that would be tipping my hand. I was already preparing for an encounter, and letting them know I was onto them wouldn't do me any favors. No reason. I said. Just wondering how lucky we really are. There were a few people who needed to know so they could prepare, but putting the garrison or the barrier wardens on high alert would just give the game away. Another two weeks would have been about perfect, just enough time to prepare some weapons and defenses for myself. I thought I'd have more time than this, and in hindsight, some useful equipment might have been a higher priority than reaching stage two. If the hawk was a familiar, and if the mage bonded with it was here, that meant an attack could come any time between an hour from now and another week. If I was wrong and the bird was just a bird after all, then I had an unknown amount of time to finish my lattice and construct myself a few defensive trinkets. No matter how I looked at it, the more time I had, the better off I'd be. My first group of students were only just now reaching the point where I could work on other projects while they practiced, and my personal growth had stagnated because of the time I'd spent tutoring them. Unfortunately, any variance in the routine could alert the unknown mage that he'd been detected. I would need to continue as I had been. It looked like I was going to be in for a sleepless night finishing up my lattice, and I'd need to carefully consider what I worked on next. It would be foolish to construct any sort of weapon while letting my opponent spy on me. Nor was a weapon the best use of my time. A reactive defense to save me from an unexpected ambush was more important. As long as I had mana at my disposal, I was confident I could beat any other mage in a duel. The lattice came first, then a shield ward of some kind, then some sort of scrying amplifier to help me find the enemy mage. It was tempting to flip that order, to find and strike first, but in terms of time and mana spent, 
the shield ward would be the work of an afternoon once I had enough mana generation to keep it powered, while a scrying amplifier would take days at minimum to put together and had no guarantee of success. All of this might still be a false alarm. Shell, I said as the students wrapped up their game. I need you to do something for me. What's that, she asked. Find out if that type of hawk sitting up there in the trees is natural to this area, and if so, how long it's been here, I said in a low voice to prevent anyone else from overhearing. May I ask why? I'm probably just being paranoid, but mages can bond with animals and use them to spy. I think we have more time before Noctra's friends come looking, but I want to be sure that hawk showing up is just a coincidence. Don't spread this around. If it is a familiar, we don't need to alert its mage that we're onto him. Got it, Shell said. I'll have an answer for you in a few hours. End Chapter 61 Chiron Book 1, The Faded Land by Emergency Complaints Chapter 62 When I was a young man, full of a burning hatred for the rich and powerful, I killed some nobleman's son. I remembered it, not because of how important the man was, but because it was the first time I'd ever seen a pocket watch. I never did quite manage to put it back together correctly, but in my defense, I had bludgeoned him to death using several telekinetically propelled rocks and damaged the pocket watch in the process. Putting my lattice together once I finished forming the last piece sometime just before pre-dawn light started brightening the sky was a similar process to playing with that watch. The pieces were tiny and required a great degree of delicacy and precision to handle. They also required a significant understanding of how things fit together, as so many of the pieces looked similar but did not function properly if switched around. I might not have been able to repair that watch, no matter how many different fabrication spells I'd utilized, but I was an expert at constructing lattices. I'd seen all kinds and spent considerable time researching them. I knew the benefits and drawbacks to basic lattices, I knew how to adapt and modify designs for individuals. And I'd given over endless hours to researching my own particular path back to power prior to my reincarnation. I could put this lattice together in my sleep, which was good because I couldn't use the mana in my core for anything else while I was integrating the lattice. Three-year-olds were not built to pull all-nighters, and without mana to keep my energy levels up, I was beyond exhausted. I finished putting the last piece of the lattice into place and felt a rush of mana cycle through it as it activated. Immediately, new mana started pouring into my core off the lattice. I spent the first minute of my lattice being active calculating my new rate of mana generation, then the next five minutes going over it and confirming it repeatedly. I'd expected to boost my mana generation from 20 times normal to 50, with some slight accommodations made for a minute loss in maximum core capacity. My lattice was extremely thin and fragile, thus why it was so time-consuming to make and put together, so the capacity loss was barely a single percent of my total. My output, confirmed by quadruple checking, was closer to 70 times normal generation, even accounting for the slightly smaller core space. I wasn't inclined to complain about it, but it shouldn't have happened. I was immediately concerned that what seemed like a boon now would come back around as a problem down the road. My lattice's modular design was a compromise forced on me by my accelerated timeline, and I was concerned that in my sleep-deprived state, I'd done irreparable harm to my potential by incorrectly slotting all the pieces together. If I couldn't disassemble the lattice to make modifications to it later, I might find myself stalled out at stage 9 again, just like in my previous life. As many times as I went through it, everything looked perfect. I redid my calculations for the hundredth time since being reborn and confirmed they were correct. By everything I knew, I should be generating 50 times my unignited rate, not 70. Either I'd made some serious mistake that I'd never caught in all the years I'd spent working on my reincarnation plan, or being born here in a mana desert had introduced an unanticipated variable. The level of ambient mana should not have made a difference. It certainly hadn't mattered when I was igniting my core. My mana core functioned precisely as planned at that step. The only difference I could see was at that point, I'd been entirely dependent on my own mana, barring a sliver I'd taken from Seneca. Now, I was using mana accumulated by the village that had been at least partially filtered through draw stones. There was no reason that should matter, but I couldn't think of anything else that had changed. Perhaps it was something on a global scale that had thrown off my calculations. I did have a missing moon and a missing written language as of yet unaccounted for. I couldn't see how that would affect my mana lattice, not at this stage. It wasn't until stage 6 that a mage needed to link to a genius loci, and I was years away from that point. Prior to that, celestial anomalies would be irrelevant. 
I was strongly tempted to tear the lattice back down so I could go over it piece by piece, but given the situation I was in with an unknown number of hostile mages potentially trying to kill or enslave me, reducing my own power right now was a terrible idea. I would just have to accept that I'd miscalculated something, move forward as best I could, and research it later when time permitted. At least the error was in my favor for the moment. I officially had a stage 2 core, strong enough to refill from empty to full in a bit over 2 hours. It wouldn't be all that helpful in a combat situation that was where stage 3 shone since those kind of fights tended to end in seconds or minutes at most, but it would greatly accelerate my prep work, which included keeping the reserves in my mana crystal close to full in addition to having the resources needed to produce enchanted items. Before any of that, I wanted a nap. I'd be relying heavily on body reinforcement invocations to function today, but at least an hour of sleep wouldn't go amiss. I'd be lucky to get that before people started showing up, but I'd do what I could. The mystery of my mana lattice would keep for another day. Stolen content alert, this content belongs on Royal Road. Report any occurrences. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. I ended up getting two hours of sleep, thanks to my sympathetic guard. He'd known I'd been up all night and had turned away my students when they'd arrived. Instead of insisting, they'd set up nearby and begun practicing without my oversight. Bless that man. I dragged myself back to consciousness through gritty eyes and a head stuffed with fuzzy cotton, took a few moments to sort myself out and get upright, then sent a burst of mana through my body to chase off my fatigue. Another quick check of my lattice confirmed that everything was working properly, if not to my specifications. There was no sign of any degradation or imbalance. My core was just sitting there, full and starting to leak mana into the atmosphere. The desert, thirsty beast that it was, soaked up the ambient mana instantly. I couldn't even begin to guess how much mana it would take to heal the scar on this land, but it would probably be the work of generations to fix it if it was left to heal naturally. Someday, when I'd recovered the full breadth of my powers, I might come study the problem in detail and see if I could devise a solution. It turned out that reincarnating in a new, young body had rejuvenated my decayed motivation to go out into the world and have an effect on it. I wanted to change things, to make them better, to see new places and meet new people. For most of the last three centuries of my life, I'd remained cloistered in the Night Vale and rarely accepted visitors. I couldn't imagine spending so many decades of my new life just sitting still, watching the world pass me by. I shook myself out of my thoughts, got dressed, and opened the door. I already knew what my students were up to, having felt the mana moving around as soon as I woke up. Not wanting to interrupt them, I settled into my seat to observe while occasionally glancing around for any feathered spies that might be nearby. Everything okay? Shell asked when she noticed me a few minutes later. I couldn't blame her for her inattentiveness considering how engrossed they all were in the training. You seem, different. Did I? Damn, I was leaking. It wasn't a secret among my trainees that I could hide my mana core from their senses, but I hadn't properly accounted for just how much more mana I was producing now than I'd been a few hours ago. I adjusted my mana shroud to compensate, but it was likely too late. I was making modifications to my mana core last night, I said. It was a long process. I'm fine, just tired now. I ignored the worry I saw in their faces. For all that I was their teacher here, and I demonstrated my capabilities in that arena quite thoroughly, I was still a child. Sometimes that fact overwrote that I was blessed by the spirits or whatever. Shell was probably the best about treating me like an adult, if only because she knew that I was mentally much, much older than her. I hadn't told the council exactly how many years I'd been practicing the art of magic, but they got the point. To the rest of the village, I was a miracle child blessed by all of their ancestors and then some, sent to free them from noxious predations and guide them to an age of prosperity. Or something like that. I should have paid closer attention to Carrot's speech. I hadn't realized he was going to go that far off script like that. Now then, as to the four of you, I think you've gotten the hang of this particular exercise, I said. So let's make it harder. The four exchanged glances while I once again lamented my lack of training tools. I couldn't justify the frivolous waste of mana on various transmutation spells to manufacture what I needed, but I could and had asked my guard from last night to fetch me a set of blindfolds. Tinzo, did you get them? I asked. Sure did, he said, opening a pouch on his belt and pulling them out. He handed them over to Ayaka, who distributed them to everyone else. Even switched to have back-to-back -back shifts just so I could watch this. 
And, what are we doing with these? Talek asked, a trace of nervousness in his voice. This exercise has three components, I explained. You'll take positions across from each other, put on the blindfolds, and then use your mana sense to keep track of each other. Whenever you feel that you are ready, you may throw a ball of mana at your opponent. Your task will be to not only track each other, but the mana being sent at you, while simultaneously forming your own ammunition and sending it at your target. Why do we need to be blindfolded? Shell asked. Because it's a lot funnier that way, I said, which earned me glares from everyone except the garrison guard. Okay, fine. It's because it's easier to sense mana when you can block out other distractions, but it can be more difficult to move when you can't see what you're doing. The blindfolds will help you see an attack coming while making it harder for you to dodge it. The earlier you sense it, the more time you'll have to adjust your own position. This training is necessary in order to receive a blessing from the spirits. Vihan asked. It was easy to see just from his expression that he didn't believe me. If by spirits you mean me, then yes, it's necessary, I told him. I don't know what any spirits might want, but I want you to do this. Anything and everything you can do to increase your ability to sense fine amounts of mana and control it is going to be useful when it comes time to complete the ignition ritual. Now, go ahead, and get into positions. Two people over here, two over there. And blindfolds on. Ready. Begin. I shared a smirk with Tinzo and my students flailed around, stumbling over uneven patches of ground where I subtly altered things with elemental manipulation. Sometimes, training was good for the teacher as well as the student. The smirk fell from my face when I glanced over and saw a familiar hawk watching us from high up in one of the trees. It reminded me that, tired as I was, I needed to use these next few hours to start constructing that shield ward. Hopefully my own work wouldn't distract my students, but if so, I'd just call it an extra challenge to keep them on their toes. I had a feeling they were going to need to be able to defend themselves sooner rather than later. The enemy might not even wait for me to ignite their cores. Or maybe that's exactly what he was waiting to see. Just how much did they know already anyway? End Chapter 62 Chiron Book 1 the Faded Land by Emergency Complaints. Chapter 63 Enchantment and Inscription were two disciplines that accomplished similar purposes through radically different methods. Enchantment was great in that it was much easier to practice since it didn't require any raw materials, and that enchanted objects could be used by non-mages. The drawback was that eventually, the mana would run out unless consideration was given to recharge it with ambient mana. In that case, the enchantment needed to remain in an area of high saturation, lest it risk running dry and breaking. In short, it wasn't really suitable for life in Alcarist, at least not for any long-term effects I wanted to utilize. There were plenty of spells that used the principles of enchantment to create temporary effects lasting anywhere from minutes to hours. The sleep spell was an excellent example of that, and would be one of the spells I introduced to future students who were part of the garrison despite Carrot's hesitation. But for making long-term enchantments, I would need to structure them in such a way that I could continually pour more and more mana into them. It wasn't impossible, but it also wasn't practical. If I was busy doing something else, I didn't want to have to enchant the piece all over again because I didn't have the spare mana for it that week. There was a reason the ward stone had runes inscribed on it. Inscriptions didn't have that problem. They were more like a guide for mana, telling it how to act in order to produce the effect. Anybody, even a village full of non-mages with dormant cores, could give an inscribed object the requisite mana, and it would produce whatever spell it needed to, no matter how long it had been sitting there. There were downsides, of course. For one, inscription needed a physical medium, and if the runes were damaged, the inscription no longer functioned. For another, inscribed objects tended to be big because a lot of runes were needed to describe the magic and while the size of the rune itself wasn't relevant, they did all need to be uniform. Of course, it was harder to carve smaller runes. When I considered how I wanted to make my shield ward, I put a lot of thought into whether I should enchant something to get me through the next few weeks or inscribe something that would last longer. I even considered doing a core invocation, which merged some principles of enchantment with inner body magics to create effects that were a continual drain directly on my mana core, but since I still wasn't sure what I'd miscalculated with my mana lattice, I decided to go in a different direction. That led me to my current project. I'd used stone shape to create a flat oval of stone with a hole on one end and then transmuted it to alabaster since I was going to be making tiny, precise cuts. 
Alabaster was one of the easiest types of stone to work with for this kind of project, so I'd grimaced and spent more mana than it would take to form an entire wall of glass to make it. Since I lacked all of the tools to carve runes, and because I'd never much understood mages who claimed the art of it all was relaxing and meditative, I cheated and used stone shape to add the runes that way. It was still a slow process, but I preferred it this way. Even the best stone carver could make mistakes, and I was pressed for time. Being able to smooth over imperfect runes to try again allowed me to rush the work so that I could finish it in a single day instead of spending weeks on the piece. There was a knock on the door just as I finished my final inspection and threaded the shard of rune carved stone with a strip of soft, supple leather. A quick glance out the window confirmed the time for me. Carrot had come to collect me for his nightly round and likely talk to me about the suspicious feathered spy lurking in the area. I paused for a second while I tried to remember if Hawks had excellent hearing as well as eyesight. Everyone who knew anything about predatory birds knew their eyesight was unrivaled, so much so that some spells used to enhance vision were named after them. There was significantly less information commonly available on their hearing, but I vaguely remembered a conversation at a roadside tavern many years ago with an inebriated druid who'd rambled about several animals whose hearing was underestimated due to them being famous for other senses. It was probably best to assume at least a human level of natural hearing, and that wasn't even getting into what invocations the hawk might be able to use if it truly was a mage's familiar. I hadn't sensed any mana coming from it, but it wasn't inconceivable that the other mages in Noctris Cabal could shroud their mana and extend that ability to a familiar. Carrot knocked again. I dropped the loop of leather over my head and tucked the amulet under my shirt, then walked across the hut to answer the door. Time to do the nightly rounds. I asked. And discuss that other thing, he said with a nod. As soon as we were away from the arborists' homes, he started to speak, but I cut him off. Not here. Wait until we get out of the trees. I got an annoyed glance and a grunt in reply, but he followed my instructions. A few minutes later, when we were out in the open, I cast a quick scrying spell to check for animals, then said, Shell told you about my familiar theory. She did. It sounds. Well, it sounds ridiculous, if I'm being honest but you're the expert in magic, not me. How likely do you think it is? If you spot this story on Amazon, know that it has been stolen. Report the violation. It's certainly possible, I said. It could just be a coincidence. There's no way to know without actually capturing the bird so I can get a good look at it. If it is a familiar, I'll be able to see the mana in it forming a bond to its mage. But if I do that and I'm right, we're letting the mage know we've discovered him. So we have to assume that any visible preparations we make are compromised, Carrot said. It gets worse, I'm afraid. There are some limits to what kinds of animals can be bonded as familiars, but I've seen plenty of examples of mice, rats, spiders, and the like being used. I have no proof the hawk is a familiar, but I also don't have any proof that it's not or that it's the only one. Mages who specialize in familiar bonds can easily keep an entire stable of animals to use as extensions of their own magic. If that's the case, I don't see how we can expect any sort of defense to succeed, Carrot said. I agree. We're either completely fine if there are no familiars, or entirely exposed if there's a mage out there spying on us. Answering that question is going to be my next project. If I can confirm the existence of an enemy mage, I might be able to take them out and end the threat before it reaches the village. How long will it take though? They could attack tonight. Or not for another week. Or not at all. I said. I don't know. Maybe I'm just being paranoid. I think someone will show up eventually, if only to find out why the guy who owed them a bunch of mana stopped making his payments. That ledger indicated that Noctra was nowhere near paying off his debt. But is there a mage staring at the village through the eyes of a hawk he bonded as a familiar right now? I just don't know. Yet. That's not a lot to go on, Gravin, Carrot said. I've given you a lot of leeway despite all the crap I'm catching for letting a little kid run around doing whatever he wants. I need something better than this. I'm working on it, I told him. Unlike you, I don't have ten other people to take care of problems for me. For example, right now I'm walking around collecting mana when I could be building a scrying amplifier to look for the hypothetical mage lurking around out in the wastelands. If I had a subordinate, I could save myself all this time. Instead, I have four trainees who are also taking up more of my time. I can only do so much with the hours I have in my day, and until some of those trainees can pick up the slack, you're going to have to be patient. 
The conversation fell off as we entered the village and didn't really resume until I'd finished emptying the draw stones. Those were seeing less and less use, and I had high hopes that the whole village would convert over to storage crystals if they decided to keep this structure. The more likely outcome in my mind was that they'd do away with it entirely once enough of them had ignited cores and the sort of communal collection was no longer necessary. How long until you've got your scrying thing ready to go, and how much mana are you going to need to power it? Carrot asked. He paused a second, then added, in terms of how many hours we're not going to be able to power the wardstone, please. Just to construct it, a day. That shouldn't use up enough mana to be noticeable. It'll be like doing a few extra panes of glass for shell. To power it and actually find someone? Well, it mostly comes down to luck. Will the mage be in the first place I look or the fifth? Is there one there at all? What if there is? but they move from a place I haven't yet looked to one I already checked and I miss them completely. You're not reassuring me here, Carrot said. I'm not trying to. I'm telling you what I'm going to do and what difficulties I'll face. You're a grown man in his forties, you shouldn't need reassurances from me, not if you plan on running this village. You know, sometimes you can be a jerk. I've been called worse, I said. Sorry, but I don't have the time or energy to coddle anyone. I'm trying to work with all of you here, and I appreciate that you've been willing to look past my appearance and take me seriously. I also appreciate that I have yet to hear any rumors about me that even come close to approaching the truth. I was sure Melmer would spread it around out of spite, if nothing else. Carrot snorted. He probably would if he believed it himself. Be that as it may, I think I'm doing a lot of good for the village. I have confidence that we'll survive the fallout of Noctra's schemes. Maybe they'll look around confirm he's dead, and leave us alone, Carrot said. I snorted, but didn't say anything. I didn't have to. Our official position remains that we're unlikely to be bothered by hostile mages, Carrot told me. Unofficially, I'd appreciate it if you could speed up your work. If you need a bit of extra mana to make it happen, that's fine by me. Unfortunately, the resource I'm short on is time, I said. That's not something you can help me with. Once you do the blessing ritual on the first group, that'll help, right? Yes and no. They'll need even more of my time to actually learn any magic, but if Ayaka can take over wardstone maintenance, that'll help even things out. Most of the magic I spend my day doing is too advanced to expect any of them to replicate in the next six months. Even the basic tier spells like Fire Blast aren't something they're going to be able to do any time soon. If I had my way they'd have another two months of training before we even ignited their cores. That long? Carrot asked. I won't actually spend that much time working with them before we do the ritual, but it would be better if I did. It's a problem of needing the short-term gains now. We're giving up long-term potential for it. They know that. They do, I confirmed. In their heads, at least. I don't think they really grasp the difference yet. Carrot let out a frustrated sigh and raked his hand through his hair. Do what you think is best. Let me know if you need anything. Mutely, I nodded. It was good that we were in agreement. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. Note, if you are reading this on a website that is not Royal Road or on my Patreon, you are reading a pirated version and that website does not have the permission of the author to host the story. Please instead read the story on Royal Road, here, as it is completely free to read on Royal Road. This story has not been published on Amazon and if you find it there, please reach out to me via DMS on Royal Road or through Discord as emergency complaints. End Chapter 63 Chiron Book 1, The Faded Land by Emergency Complaints Chapter 64 After I got back, I had tonight's door guard help me test my new shield ward by throwing things at me. Maintaining something like a mana shield at all times was far too expensive, but wards had the advantage of being extremely cheap to power. At least, they did if they weren't designed to create a miles-wide barrier. For a single person, a personal defense ward was far more manageable. The key to a good ward was that it relied heavily on divinations to detect the conditions under which it should activate another spell. Most of what made my amulet complicated was defining what those conditions were. Any physical object coming at me with significant speed and mass would cause the runes to activate a mana shield. The ward did its best to automatically regulate how much mana needed to go into it to keep me safe, so it needed additional runes to judge factors like weight and pointiness. If a spell came my way, the ward would do its best to disrupt it. Failing that, 
the amulet would try to slow the attack down so that I could react to the magic. At its heart, that was the shield ward's purpose, to give me enough time to evaluate the threat and prevent an ambush from taking me out. I had to sacrifice flexibility to keep it portable, but it worked. I did have to imbue a significant chunk of mana into it to keep the wards active and so that it would have the resources necessary to repel an attack. Once every few days, I'd want to top it off, but if all the mana did get drained out such as if I was attacked the inscription wouldn't break like an enchantment would. For my next project, I created a piece of glass shape to be about 3 feet by 1 foot in dimensions. That was the easy part. Scrying mirrors didn't work if they weren't mirrors. Unlike a regular mirror that used silver paint as a backing, a scrying mirror needed liquid mana infused into it in order to serve as a lens for the spell. Unfortunately for me, the easiest way to collect liquid mana was through various plant life that thrived in mana-rich environments. That didn't mean it was impossible to get my hands on, just that I'd have to do the conversions myself. I borrowed a wooden bowl from one of my new neighbors and was in the process of slowly dripping beads of liquefied mana off my fingertip into the bowl when someone knocked on my door. Come in, I called out, not looking up from my work. Mana didn't like to exist in physical form, and it rapidly converted through states until it crystallized. Keeping it in that medium state of liquid was an exercise in concentration and stamina. Gravy, my sister said as she rushed across the room to tackle me with a hug. The drop of liquid mana that had been about to drop off my finger went flying into the air, where it flashed apart back into its natural state. Her eyes wide, Seneca watched it disappear while she ignored my glare. What was that, she asked. Just a magic thing. Don't worry about it, I said as I looked past her to see father standing in the doorframe. Sorry to visit so late, he said. Seneca wanted to come see you. She was not happy that she was asleep when you came to visit us. I don't see why you have to live out here anyway, she complained. Well, partially it's because I use my magic to help the arborists. We're fixing up all the greenhouses and building a new one, and making the trees grow healthier so there's more fruit for everyone. And partially it's because they're afraid I'll blow something up in the middle of the village and people will get hurt. This was a compromise as a place to live that's not too close to the middle of everything. They're still working on a new home for you on the east side where there are no fields, father said. Are they? No one has mentioned it to me since it was floated as an idea before I ended up here. There were a few guys working on it, but it's a slow process. We'll probably have another harvest in before it's done. I'm sure the arborists will appreciate it, I said as I extracted myself from Seneca's hug so that I could relocate the bowl to a safer spot on a shelf. They haven't said anything, but I get the sense this place was being used for storage and none of them are thrilled about giving up a corner in their own homes for all the things that used to be in here. What have you been doing here? Seneca asked. Mostly teaching people how to use magic, I said. Making glass for the greenhouses. Preventing insects from getting into the trees. A case of theft, this story is not rightfully on Amazon, if you spot it, report the violation. I wasn't about to tell anyone that I'd brought my core up to stage 2. Noctra's experiments told me that the concept of a mono lattice wasn't unknown to the local mages. He might not have known exactly what the best lattice for himself was, but he was smart enough to be trying to figure it out. There was no reason not to expect the other mages in his cabal to not have the same knowledge or even more. I could be facing several mages with stage 3 cores. If that was the case, I needed every advantage I could get, which right now meant stockpiling as much mana as I possibly could. My next piece of equipment might need to be a larger mana crystal at the rate I was going. My current mana crystal would give me everything I needed to handle one stage 3 mage. If I got lucky, I could take on two. I would have to catch them completely off guard in order to kill three mages. Insects? That sounds boring and gross, Seneca said. It can be both of those things, I agreed. And not all insects are bad, but these ones were. Maybe I should learn how to do this, Seneca said, a thoughtful frown on her face. Would it help mom in the garden? I glanced over at father and asked, she needs help in the garden? It looked fine to me. No, no. I've been giving the full tithe amount for the whole family so your mother can get the garden back in order and your sister can practice. That explained why Seneca still had mana in her core less than an hour after the tithing. She should have been running on empty and exhausted enough to already be asleep. And I've been practicing a lot. Seneca announced. Father showed me how to do the stuff you taught him. Really? Can I see? 
I asked. I wasn't expecting much. I'd already taken a measure of Seneca's talents and while she was good for a child, that wasn't that same as just being good. I was sure that if she kept at it, one day she'd be a prime candidate to learn magic, but that day was still years down the road. Mana swirled in Seneca's core, slowly at first, but faster and faster as she concentrated on it. I shot father a look, knowing he could also feel Seneca's mana move, and he nodded back. Huh, I said. How about that? The mana jumped out of her core, flashing down her limbs and back again, just like she'd done back in the wastes, except much faster now. Then an orb of it manifested in her hand. She threw it up into the air, where it perfectly maintained its shape without leaking a single bit out, before she caught it in her other hand and absorbed it back into her core. The entire time she was doing that, her mana kept spinning, faster and faster. She wasn't quite up to the point where I'd let her complete an ignition ritual on her own, but she could probably do it if she was given enough mana. Against any expectations I had, she was inexplicably ready to move her core to stage one right now, at least if I helped her. That's, very impressive, I said. Like I said, I've been practicing a lot, she told me smugly. Father, how much time have you spent on practice with her? I asked. Not too much. They've been working me pretty late up until last week. I went over what you taught me and made sure she was doing it right, and she's just been going at it on her own every night. I bet I'm better than you now, Seneca told me. Maybe not quite yet, I said. Give it a few more weeks to practice and I'm sure you'll catch up. I can teach you some other exercises if you'd like. It took me less than 20 minutes to figure out that Seneca was better than any of my current four candidates. Maybe it was the free time, or how much energy she had to goof around and Mana was a shiny new toy, or maybe it was just that our family line was talented. It was hard for me to say what Gravin would have been capable of if I hadn't awakened my past life's memories. I gave brief consideration to performing the ignition ritual on her, but ultimately decided against offering it. Despite her apparent talents, she was still a child and soon there would be spells circulating through the village. It wasn't impossible to imagine her getting her hands on instructions to cast dangerous magic. Of course, a dormant core by itself wouldn't be enough to stop her, but it would mitigate her ability to practice it to such a degree that she was unlikely to catch anything on fire in the next year or two. All the same, I made a note to talk to our parents about her progress when she wasn't around. Perhaps finding out that his daughter was so talented would convince father to reconsider wasting his own mana as a field hand. It also might just get mother to accept her own ignition, even if all she ever learned were gardening spells. The pair stayed an hour or so, just long enough to catch up on everything. Mother had come down sick and decided to stay home and rest. Father's duties were more in line with everyone else's now. Seneca wasn't necessarily enjoying school, but Cherik hadn't tried to pull any new tricks on our family using her as a weak point. Other than resolving to stop by sometime in the near future to check on mother and see if she needed magical healing, it was a good visit. It gave me time to relax, to disengage from work for just a little while. I'd been so focused on creating new tools, training new mages, and piecing together my mana lattice that I'd barely taken time to breathe. Every night, I slept less and less and I'd begun pulling all-nighters. Thank you for visiting, I said. I didn't realize how much I missed you. Father gave me a hug on his way out, but didn't linger at my doorway. Seneca was already racing ahead, Mana faintly coursing through her body to give her more strength and speed. You should come home more often, he offered as his parting words. It's not like we're that far away. I will, I promised, though it was a lot more complicated than that. I found that I meant that, too. As soon as my preparations were complete, I was going to make more time to see my family, Carrot's house arrest be damned. My temporary home empty once more, I turned back to my bowl of liquid mana. The sooner I finished the step, the sooner I'd have the scrying mirror operational. Then we'd see just how much danger we were really in. End chapter 64 Chiron Book 1, The Faded Land by Emergency Complaints Chapter 65 Shell and Carrot sat on either side of me and watched my new scrying mirror as it followed after the black barred hawk. For the last hour, it had flown in a rough circle around the arbor, stopping frequently to rest and scan the ground for prey. Are you really sure this is the best use of your time, the garrison commander asked. This bird is. This is nothing. This is the only lead I've got, I said. 
it's this or just randomly look around the wastelands and hope to spot something. If there is a mage out there and they're smart, they won't be in the open anyway. It would take far more mana than we've got to effectively find them through magic alone. The hawk lifted off suddenly and all three of us leaned forward. Usually it took short flights of a few seconds here and there, but this time it was rising up into the air and not showing any signs of coming back down. I sat back, a satisfied grin on my face, and said, now let's see where you go when you're not here. The fact that the hawk wasn't wheeling around through the sky, circling endlessly in search of food, gave me hope. It was on a mostly straight course west and north of the village and would arrive at the mountains in minutes. While it was possible it had a nest there and I'd find nothing of interest or importance at the end of its journey, I didn't think that was going to be the case. Sure enough, the hawk entered a cave halfway up the side of the mountain and I willed my scrying sensor to follow it. Inside, a sort of rough home had been set up, with a bedroll for sleeping on, a rug, and a small workbench. The owner of those supplies was sitting near a campfire that clearly burned only through the power of magic since it lacked any wood. He was a man, probably fifty or so years old by the looks of him, but possibly much older if he was using magic to prolong his life. For all the wrinkles on his face and his gnarled hands, he certainly moved like a man half his age. He lifted an arm for the hawk to settle on, completely ungloved, and it landed gracefully enough that the man didn't even flinch as its talons circled around his arm. That's either a very, very well-trained bird, or there's magic involved, I said. I think we can safely assume we've found a mage who's interested in the village. I suppose it could be a coincidence and this person has nothing to do with the cabal, but that's stretching things. Can your spell let us hear him? Shell asked as she leaned closer to study the man's appearance. Not through the mirror, unfortunately. I'd need another day to modify it for that. It's real, then. There really are hostile mages watching the village. What do they want? Carrot asked. My guess would be the mana that's going into the ward stone, I said. They obviously know about it. The real question is whether they'll be reasonable and accept that Noctra's dead, or if they'll try to take over and resume his operation. I got the impression that he wasn't here voluntarily, Carrot said. Iskara was his keeper, I agreed. She was the one handling all the draw stones. To me, that says not only was he not here by choice, but he wasn't even trusted by the Cabal to hand over the mana he harvested. That doesn't sound like an organization that's interested in taking no for an answer. What I really wonder about was if the governor before Noctra was also associated with them. I don't see how he could have been. The ward stone worked back then and there was no tithe. What mana was there to give them? Carrot asked. That was a good point. It was far more likely that the wolf pack was aware of our little village and wanted Emito to join their cabal, but he'd refused. They'd eventually learned about his death and sent one of their junior members who was in trouble with the cabal out to manage the place and turn it into a mana farm. I had no proof, of course, but everything made sense in my theory. So what now? Do we wait for this mage to come to us or go attack him first? Shell said. We don't do anything, I told her. I am going to continue to investigate before I make a move. It looks like this mage is here by himself, and he is most likely part of Noctra's cabal, but we don't know for sure. I can't imagine there being another person living in this camp with him, but there could be other camps. Why would they come separately? Carrot asked. That doesn't make sense. Only if they're part of the same group. Whoever this mage is, he's been observing us for over a week and hasn't made a move. What is his goal? Is he going to just gather information and then leave? Is he even part of the wolf pack? Unauthorized use, this story is on Amazon without permission from the author. Report any sightings. You think he might not be? Carrot asked, a look of confusion on his face. No, I'm sure he is. But there's a possibility that I'm wrong, and I'd rather not attack an innocent man who's just looking around. Taking someone's life just because he's acting suspicious without any proof isn't the way I want to go about handling this situation. There'd been a time when I would have already killed the man, back when I was paranoid that everyone was out to get me. Considering the awful things I'd done, it was an entirely justified paranoia, but it had led me down an even darker road that resulted in a lot more death and destruction, most of which could have been avoided. I would say that I applaud your restraint if the situation were different, Carrot said, but can we afford to continue to let this mage set up whatever plans he's working on? We should at the very least capture and secure him while you investigate. 
How do you plan to do that? I asked. Even if the mage's core was only at stage 1, I'd need to stand guard over him constantly to keep his mana drained below a usable level. There were other ways to do it, but they were mildly torturous and included things like driving spikes made of draw stone into the man's body. Even incapacitating spells like sleep didn't tend to work well on mages. Anyone who knew what they were doing would absorb the artificial enchantment core even if they were unconscious. The spell might even fail to take hold at all if they were aware it was coming and good enough to fight it off. It wasn't impossible to make it work, but it would require a huge investment of mana to overcome a mage's natural resistance. That was just for a mage with a stage 1 core. At stage 3, it would take the entirety of my mana crystal to put that mage down even for a few minutes, and I'd need to take him by surprise. Since my scrying mirror didn't let me sense mana, I had no way to tell what kind of fight I'd be walking into right now. I needed to plan for the worst and hope I'd be pleasantly surprised. We could use the draw stones, Carrot said. No, Shell told him. Even I can resist those easily now. Anyone with a bit of practice can figure it out. I've actually been wondering how many people have been doing it all along with the nightly tithe. Ayaka has been telling me that the collectors keep records and have suspected some people figured out how years ago and just kept it quiet. What a mess. It's temporary. I said absently as I leaned closer to the mirror. The mage in question had finished feeding his hawk scraps of meat and it had flapped over to a perch set up for it. Now he was writing something down in a journal, but I was wary about getting the scrying sensor closer to him so I could read it. I'd taken measures to keep it shrouded and undetected, but the closer I got, the more likely it was that he'd notice it anyway. How long is temporary? Carrot asked. I don't know, I said. I hadn't seen evidence of wards, but if there were any, they'd be set up at the mouth of the cave. Sending my scrying spell deeper in would risk alerting the mage, no matter how well I'd hidden my magic. I just couldn't quite make out what he was writing from my current angle. If he would turn just a little bit. The bird must have made some noise, because the mage shifted, turning at the waist to look at it. I saw his mouth move, but I didn't bother to try to read his lips, not with the page finally visible to me. I might only have moments to skim its contents names. It was dozens of the villagers, most crossed out. Ayaka was on there, with an underline. So was my sister, though she had a question mark next to her name. Father and mother were listed right next to her. She also got a question mark, but father was underlined. He's trying to figure out who can use magic, I said. That's what the spying is for. Noctra had done the same thing, now that I thought about it. He'd singled father out based on our testing results as someone with unusual talent, kidnapped him, and had been in process of sending him to Darrow, presumably to his associates there. I wasn't sure what the cabal was going to use them for exactly, but Noctra had made it obvious he didn't care about father's wishes, only that by delivering what he saw as a magic-capable person, he'd clear some of his own debt. The mage turned again and blocked my view of the journal he was writing in. He flipped to the back, noted something else down, then tore out a strip of paper. With a practiced motion and likely a bit of mana to seal the paper, he tied it to the hawk's leg. It immediately flew off, and I pulled the scrying sensor back to keep an eye on it. He's in contact with somebody, I said. It would almost have to be someone close by if he's using his familiar to pass notes. Darrow is too far away for a hawk to fly there and back in one day, and it's been hanging around the village every day. I ignored Carrot and Shell as they debated what the mage we'd found was up to and what it meant for the village while I chased the familiar through the sky with my scrying sensor. About 15 minutes later, it dove into some rocky crag southwest of town. There, with their camp hidden by walls of stone, were another six men. Four of them were dressed in something similar enough that I took it as a uniform, baggy black canvas pants tucked into calf-high boots with a sleeveless green tunic belted at the waist. Each was armed with a one-handed axe on their belts and I spotted unstrung bows with quivers of arrows near their tents. Of the other two, one of them was wearing an outfit that had the same general color scheme, but with a lot more ornamentation on the belt, thick leather bracers, and a band of what looked like rune-etched copper wrapped around one bicep. I mentally pegged him as a commander to the other four. The last one, the one the hawk had delivered the message to, was obviously a mage. It wasn't the elaborately braided pale blonde hair or the half-dozen rings on his fingers that gave it away. It wasn't even the expensive cloak dyed a dark purple or the pendant with an amethyst two inches wide on it. No, the real tell was the staff that floated upright next to him while he read the message. 
It was six feet in height and I counted no less than four monocrystals studding its surface in a band around the top. At least two mages working together and what looks like five hunters, I said. This is going to be trouble. End chapter 65